Yeah. All right. All right. We're already uh, we're already a little behind here, so let's get to it because there's at least a couple of things that will be on the midterm uh, that we're going to need to know. Um, so I'm going to make sure we cover it at least a little bit. Um, all right. So there is a study guide up here uh, from last year um, that's got some some prompts. So usually when I do study guides, I, I try to be a little more focused with them because the last thing I want is for people to waste time studying things that aren't going to be on the exam. I, I figure that if you're studying for an exam just to pass it and you're not going to remember anything afterwards anyway, then I'm, I'm probably not doing a very good job. Not that I necessarily feel like I am, but that's what the point is, is when we don't study for the exam. But unfortunately, the study guide from last year is a little bit unfocused. They're just kind of general topics like you know what a horse law is kind of a thing. So I think what I'm going to do this year, rather than just leave you with this, is we'll go over these to make sure that they've all been covered. Uh, and then probably what I will do is, in addition to the midterm, which, again, will open up on Sunday. Uh, let me make sure that it's set correctly. It ought to be. We'll open on Sunday. I believe that this one is a two attempts. The highest score is kept kind of a deal. Ah, son of a bitch. Oh, that's right. This is the the Canvas updated their quizzes, and uh, now we're being asked to use the new quizzes instead of the old. So sadly, I have a lot less control over how the quizzes work. Um, I have to go in here. Let's see what my options are. Um, yeah, I guess I. The new, biz, the new quizzes don't have the option to take multiple attempts. Well, I'll do my best with it, I guess. But yeah, typically I'll give you two attempts, keep the highest score, and uh, two hours, true, false, multiple choice, uh, multi-select, no short answer, no essay. And the uh, quiz you get, or sorry, the score you get after you get done taking it will probably be either slightly or significantly lower than your final score because I go through afterwards, look at all the questions, see which ones were unfair. Either I wrote them incorrectly or um, it just wasn't a fair question to ask and most students missed it and I dropped those. So your final score will be higher than what you're actually gonna see, but it should give you a pretty good idea within a couple of percentage points. Um, that will again open up on Sunday. It will close on the following Sunday. <clears throat> Um, make sure, yes, open book, open note, use the internet, use my notes, use your notes, use whatever you have at your disposal, it'll be just fine. Um, the questions uh, will be formatted as such that you won't be able to just control F anyway, but you might need your notes in order to sort of even understand or, or recall the concepts typically here. So like, for example, number one here, we haven't talked about a horse law in detail just yet, uh, but it asks you to describe a horse law and identify them when you see them. So for example, a question that you might find on the exam uh, might be something like, uh, would the Lanham Act be considered a horse law or something like that? So it would require you to understand what a horse law is, look up the Lanham Act, see when it was passed and what it does, and then make a determination. That might be a true false example sort of question. So we'll cover horse laws today, hopefully. Um, number two, when we're talking about interpersonal social engineering tactics, we're talking about the hard and soft tactics from units, I think it was week five, the social engineering unit. Uh, last year, I went into a lot more depth on that. Um, so when you hear tactics, or if you see a question regarding tactics, it's going to refer to what we talked about this semester, because we didn't cover sea lining or gish galloping or any of that other internet kind of trickery as far as social engineering tactics go. So that's what you're gonna be looking for. So it's in the social engineering unit. It's gonna be those slides where you see the hard and soft tactics, everything from rational persuasion down to inspirational appeal. That's what we'll be referring to. Um, understand the difference between information quality and value and the traits of each. Um, that is normally a topic that you would begin to understand in 226, but this is a mixed class. So any questions on that <clears throat> will relate probably more to more fair questions uh, that we would have covered in, in the beginning units of this course. 
something along the lines of, uh, let's see, do I have any questions already written in this one? Um, so it might be like a, a general question of uh, which do you think might be more valuable on the black market? Would it be something like a medical record, driver's license information, or credit card information, um, something like that? And you would be expected to sort of extrapolate that based upon the utility of the information that something that could be used to steal somebody's identity and take out a credit card would obviously be more valuable than the credit card itself. And of those remaining two choices, medical records gives you the information that you need in order to do that, whereas a driver's license. Um, infer information about a computer system when presented data. This is the uh, probably the most nefarious of the prompts here for studying, because how are you going to study for something like that? Oh, I'm sorry. I've been trying to get through this so fast. I may have forgot to mention uh, that because I don't want to just leave you with this, probably what I will also do is in addition to the midterm, I will probably also have a practice quiz of maybe five questions or so. So that way you get a sense for the kind of questions that'll be on the, the midterm. Something you can just kind of do to understand where I'm coming from. What I mean by number four is you might get, uh, for example, a set, a set of data. So I might give you, for example, a text file that amounts to a diary or something like that, that um, you know, maybe has some sample text in it that uh, refers to, you know, um, them reading some book and then having a nightmare that they've been transformed into an insect. Now they want to go to the beach and stuff like that. And you may have multiple choice questions that would be something along the lines of um, within the next year or so, this person is most likely going to visit Venice Beach or, or some other options like that. Um, truly about variants. Uh, those are the questions that do tend to get thrown out. So if you see something like that and you think to yourself, my God, how the hell am I supposed to answer this? Probably not the only one. Don't sweat it too much. Uh, we did cover data information, knowledge, and wisdom. Uh, there was a whole unit on that uh, a couple of weeks ago. So for a fair uh, example of a question that you might see on something like that, I might give you some data points, simple like maybe um, Windows event logs or something like that, just entries in that. And just giving you that information, you'll have multiple choice. I might ask you something like, given what we have with these data points, um, you know, what would you say best represents converting that data into information? And the prompts might be something like, um, we, we need to update this machine with security patches or um, something like that. Um, you know, three, three or four choices that represent the difference between information, knowledge, and wisdom in my case. Um, review social theories, uh, the only one that we covered this semester, the only one that I decided to include in the beginning anyway, uh, is the uh, space, spatial transition theory, space transition theory. Um, so that one you're definitely gonna wanna know. Uh, we didn't cover anything else in that unit. We didn't cover reciprocal determinism, uh, routine activities or any of that. So just the one. So understand space transition, the dark tetrad and so on. Uh, we'll cover the CFAA in this unit. So just, know how to find it, basically Google the CFAA. It's all available out on the public internet, so it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, oh yeah, number eight is the next one that students always struggle with because the difference between supplementing and supporting human work can be um, nuanced, I suppose, at times. So I'm gonna take care with the questions this time around. I'm gonna try and make sure that it's blatantly obvious which is which. We did cover that early on. Remember that uh, the difference between supplementing and supporting human work is that when technology supplements our work, it removes us from the equation entirely. We build a machine to do the work for us. We need to do nothing else but turn on the machine. Whereas supporting human work um, makes our jobs easier, and more efficient, right? So if we have a backhoe that supports the human work of digging trenches, uh, but if we build a robot, run the backhoe, well, we're no longer involved at all. We just need to worry about the robot. Enhancing is usually pretty easy. It's technology that allows us to do something that would otherwise be impossible, uh, like night vision goggles and such. So that one's usually a little bit easier to identify. Um, there will be questions uh, concerning obscenity and indecency. So you should know at least the Miller test from Miller v. California. I'm not gonna ask you about uh, the case specifically. So you don't need to read it or anything. 
But when you hear about the Miller test or Miller v. California, you should be able to apply the Miller test to a scenario in this case. Uh, forget about number 10. That's a 226 topic, and I just cut it from this class because of the, the mixed nature of the class, so we're not going to cover the CIA triad. Um, I, I should say, actually, there will be questions on privacy because we did cover that. So uh, privacy as it pertains at least to the Fourth Amendment will be on there. Understand elements that distinguish online communication from offline. Um, so there was the distinguishing features of online communication, anonymity, constant connectivity, permanence. Um, so you will be asked questions on those. Not So for example, a question you might face is, um, would be a multiple choice between those different features. It might be something like, um, at school, Josh is picked on by a girl in a class above him. Um, online, Josh goes home and he's playing Roblox and somebody bullies him. The distinguishing difference between this and that would be, for example, anonymity, right? At least he knows who's bullying him in real life, but we'll cover online harassment in this unit as well, so. Um, forget number 12. Uh, we didn't cover security controls or measures yet. So that got moved. Uh, and ethics got moved. So forget 13. Uh, 14 does apply. Uh, there will be some questions regarding Section 230. There will be questions regarding the Sixth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and the First Amendment, and so on on there as well. But for that, you want to rely on the sample quiz. So make sure that you at least check that out before you take the midterm so you know what you're in for, because there will be at least a couple of questions regarding constitutional rights on the sample quiz. And if there are any questions, please let me know now or later, that's fine. We do have a whole week. So if you're not absolutely 100% certain that you're prepared to take the quiz, uh, we can at least go over it beforehand. Or if you take it the first time and you botch it, you need help, then fine, just take a break between the two. There's no, no limits. You don't have to take them both one, uh, right away back to back or whatever okay uh what else uh, i think that about covers it is there anything unclear yeah i think we, i think we got it more or less all right but we do have to cover some of this so this week we're talking about digital citizenship and the information aid we just got done talking about constitutional rights and how we don't have any so now we need to go and move on to talking about what is expected of us. <clears throat> so this is an important topic in this class because the concept of digital citizenship transcends individual rights and individual abilities on the internet, which we've been talking about last week, but also uh, speaks to another important cyber sociological topic for cybersecurity, which is security awareness training. We talked about how most training sucks. Uh, it's just kind of a compliance check mark in a lot of different cases, and how even if we do have someone's undivided attention, it also tends to be ineffective because really what we're doing is we're only training one specific schema of our employees, right? Their employee schema. It doesn't help when they're at home, it doesn't help when they bring things into the office. It's kind of an impermanent sort of solution. And digital citizenship is really uh, what we want to improve on in those employees because rather than just training a specific schema, getting 80% on the quiz and doing that compliance check mark, truly training somebody to be a good digital citizen, whatever that happens to mean, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is more of a permanent solution. It, uh, it empowers people to make good decisions online, to be responsible, to understand not necessarily how the technology works, but at least how to use them responsibly and appropriately and so on. So that is what digital citizenship is. It is the continuously developing, continuously developing norms that um, surround technology use. So there are legal norms, there are social norms. We follow both in real life. The early days of the internet with the Usenet systems, BBSs and so on, um, there really wasn't, social norms didn't transcend. And so there was a lot of, a lot of trolls, a lot of, misbehavior a lot of stuff until eventually you know legal norms began to be enforced and social norms developed it takes time to do that kind of thing the thing is is that norms evolve and they change all the time one of the reasons that social norms solidified online and have become what they are today 
is because in the early days, it was a fairly small population of individuals kind of making up the rules as they went along. And a lot of those people tended to be social maladaptive to begin with, and so kind of brought that online along with them. But these days, everyone is online, and so everyone contributing to those norms changes them. It's an evolving system. It's dictated entirely by our culture and the social norms that we decide to bring with us. And so we tell kids in school at a very young age these days what it is to be a good citizen, but most of what we tell kids and probably most of what you heard usually amounts to scary things that you definitely should not do online. Very rare are we told the things that we should do. So we learn to avoid danger, but we don't really learn to participate and change things for the common good. And so within the industry of cybersecurity that is changing, now what we say, what is a good citizen? What do good citizens do? Well, they of course help people, right? They help people to learn technology, to get caught up to speed, to learn the rules, the unwritten rules of the internet, build a positive experience for people, to understand that when we do something online, it's not just going out into cyberspace and doesn't have any effect on people. That People online are people, and what we do does affect them, that the, kind of the actions that we have have consequences, sometimes consequences far beyond what we initially perceive. As we talked about last week as well, with uh, the concept of public shaming and cancel culture, you know, sometimes just retweeting something can have a widespread effect because you're amplifying a message when you do. And then, of course, coming directly from the ethics of the industry itself, to of course participate in a manner that supports the common good, that furthers our um, development and sharing of information that doesn't hamper it, and so on. This is what we're telling children, but of course the truth is far more complicated than this. This is just a message that's distilled down for young learners. So there's a concept known as the nine elements of citizenship. I'm not gonna necessarily sit here and read all of them to you, especially since we're already running way behind on time here today. But basically what it comes down to is the elements of good digital citizenship mean providing access to information, to abilities, to online resources, not uh, squirreling things away and keeping them for yourself. This is a tenant of good citizenship that most businesses fail at. As a matter of fact, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was playing a game what was it called? It was some OSINT cybersecurity game or something like that. I can't remember what it was called. But the game was, had um, alternate reality game elements. So you'd be playing along, you'd come across information that related to things in the real world. You had to go out on the public internet to find answers to, to clues and solve mysteries and stuff like that. And the developers relied on the Chicago Tribune for one of these clues and uh, they felt safe in doing so. As a matter of fact, somebody posted on the Steam forums for the game that said, hey, I don't know if using the Chicago Tribune is a good idea uh, because what if someday they decide to pull their archives and their response back in 2020, <laughs> it's only a couple of years ago, was, oh, the Chicago Tribune's archives have been open and free for 50 years, come on. Well, can you guess what happened when I played the game? I went to the Chicago Tribune and all that shit's paywall right. So um, companies typically will violate this one more than people so much, but people also participate in these systems. And so, you know, just economics dictates that sometimes good citizens participate in systems that don't necessarily benefit them or the public good. We're gonna talk about YouTube algorithms. This, uh, probably not today, but maybe. Um, which, I mean, YouTube is a great platform for sharing long form content or, um, well, I guess now they have shorts, but let's face it, those suck. Um, they're just trying to compete with TikTok. Um, but <laughs> but <clears throat> um, by putting content out there, you're sharing it, but it also becomes part of the YouTube machine, right? And they're making their money and all that kind of stuff. So you're, you're directly benefiting Google, uh, and YouTube as a subsidiary. Uh, you're contributing to their systems. You're contributing to the common good and sharing that information, but it's all participating in a machine. Uh, that does not necessarily benefit anyone more than Google does. 
Uh, digital commerce, buying and selling of goods, of course, uh, the online marketplace being what it is. Generally speaking, again, economic forces dictating policy in these cases. So it's usually really easy to buy things online, at least most things. And for a while there, it became insanely easy to even buy things that you can't buy or shouldn't buy in real life, like drugs. So the digital commerce uh, clause here in citizenship being tested to its limit. The first thing sold over the internet, if I didn't mention it before, uh, officially is 1994, Pizza Hut Pizza. But unofficially, the first thing actually sold over the internet was drugs uh, between students at Berkeley and MIT as they were linking their networks together and sold a dime bag over the internet. So there's a long history of digital commerce, buying and selling things. And then of course, we do run into um, other issues as well. For example, buying and selling things that are illegal in certain jurisdictions, but not others, or in certain countries, but not others. Um, here in Wisconsin, we have fairly liberal weapons laws and such. Uh, for example, I always carry um, lock picks around with me, just a little Southern or jackknife. It's just come in handy far too often for me to just leave it sitting around. So I carry it along with me and in the state of Wisconsin, normally that's hunky dory, but uh, you can buy those online no matter where you happen to be. And if you're in Massachusetts, just having them is illegal. Here in Wisconsin, if I got caught breaking and entering and I had them in my pocket, then it would automatically amplify the sentence because and I'm carrying them with intent. Um, so jurisdictions, right? They're weird. The laws are weird. They're different everywhere, but on the internet, it's great equalizer. Everything is the same and everything can be sold everywhere. And for a long time, people didn't even pay taxes on their online purchases. So of course, interests got involved and they wanted their cut too. Amazon. Amazon got too big. As soon as Amazon started selling more than Walmart, suddenly they were ripping interest in everyone paying income, or, uh, sales tax. Uh, digital communication and collaboration, right? It is the public forum. We do have the right to freedom of assembly and so on, at least here in the United States. Having places to congregate and exchange information, the basis upon which Lester Packingham, the Supreme Court appeal was found. Having, having, to, having to have access to that or, or getting access to that universal right. And so a good citizen ensures that collaboration is possible, that messages aren't erroneously suppressed and so on. Uh, but in this vein, again, we find that there's plenty of people out on the internet that are not being very good citizens that are intentionally suppressing certain messages, amplifying others. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at social media, uh, YouTube, Reddit, Twitter, any of those, um, the online cyber war that extends from the war going on between Ukraine and Russia, raging. Um, lately, I've been getting some strange comments, some of my YouTube videos, um, from uh, people who assume, of course, uh, that I should be the target of uh, Russian message suppression or something like that. Um, it's really interesting stuff, but it's widespread. It's all over the place. So some people not exactly being good digital citizens out there and trying to get their message upvoted. Everyone else is downvoted. We'll talk about more, more about that later. Digital etiquette, electronic standards of conduct. I'm not talking about uh, internet comment etic etiquette with Eric. Although that's a good channel, you should watch it. But uh, the conduct, the procedures, the way of doing things, you can always tell when somebody is new in a certain area because they don't know the parlance. There's a uh, term for that in linguistics. We call it argo, A-R-G-O-T. Makes up the jargon and the slang and so on that acts as border maintenance mechanisms for in-group and out-group identification. So you know that somebody is a noob because they're not using the right parlance. Digital fluency, the process of understanding technology and its use, the crux upon which older generations are defined online. I mentioned before, grandma, I think she clicks on the blue E icon and she opens up the internet and anything else that she'd have to do, she has absolutely no idea. Uh, these functionally illiterate users are still around. No offense to grandma, of course. That's just what the term is in terms of the uh, steel taxonomy for digital ideographic profiling. Uh, the functionally illiterate category defines those that essentially learn by rote memorization how to do certain things on computer systems, but anything that would take them off the rails in that regard, they're completely lost. And it's a real problem. Um, it's a problem that we thought was going to fade 
uh, as newer generations assume their positions in the workforces. Um, but it actually hasn't. It's a really weird thing, especially, you know, I'm sure you guys probably have a lot of friends who are also, you know, in the tech stuff and they're probably even maybe even in the same major or already working in IT or something like that. Probably have a lot of contact with people that are fairly literate in their technology use. Um, well, I can assure you as someone who also teaches across departments in criminal justice and sociology, uh, that doesn't necessarily extend to everybody in your generation, certainly not everybody in mine or, or anywhere in between. Uh, there's a lot of students who are just completely lost. They have absolutely no idea what to do. For, uh, for a lot of them, this is a computer. This is what they use. That's their technology. And that's really about it. And they, they don't even know how to do things on that other than, you know, get stuff from the uh, app store or whatever and, and run it. That's about it. And this is a real problem, especially uh, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, a quote from Carl Sagan, um, a uh, rather grim view of his future, potentially our present, uh, at which people become so functionally illiterate about most things, not just with technology, but with science in general, um, that they're clinging to their horoscopes and their crystals, and they can't tell what's real because so much of the world is unknown and foreign, terrifying, and well, virtual, right? So it's a problem because digital literacy and media literacy are all online these days. And we can't tell fake from real if we don't have that fluency. And then digital health and welfare, the, uh, the one element, if anything else, of digital citizenship that parents everywhere cling to. Actually, I don't know if you all have parents who are very concerned about your screen time. I know quite a few. I often will go out and, and give talks to parents at, for example, Pacelli or Spash or, or even the junior highs and stuff sometimes. Uh, and I usually end up spending a good amount of the time that I'm there trying to assuage the fears of parents that just because their kid is on a tablet for an hour a day, uh, that they're going to be preyed upon by cyber criminals or they'll turn into zombies. And it's all they think about are those damn plants and those damn zombies. It's all they want to do. Like, well, of course. Of course, that's all they want to do. And there is obviously a healthy balance between online and offline. You need to have a bit of both. You got to go out and touch grass once in a while. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, but it's, uh, it's not something that is generally as fearful or, or to generate as much fear, I guess as a lot of parents would think. Um, certainly children shouldn't be only spending their time online, but the, the line is not as easily delineated as saying this much time is bad, this much time is bad. Just like in the olden days, right? When they said, if you sit too close to a screen, you're gonna ruin your eyes, you're gonna need glasses. Well, it turns out that's not really necessarily true, either, right? Turns out that eye strain is temporary. So um, that's the one that tends to be latched onto. But what the balance is, isn't necessarily as clear cut. It might be as simple as how are you practicing your cyber hygiene? How are you at practicing the rest of these elements of citizenship? And it may also be different for other people. Because it's true when we talk about solipsism syndrome and we talked about Lane Davis last week, uh, that there are psychological impacts to spending far too much time online. Right? You get to that terminally online stage and you to experience solipsism syndrome. But like all potential mental disturbances, there might be some who simply have a proclivity for it and others who don't, who are maybe more resilient, can spend more time online and it doesn't affect them as much. Knowing your law, rights and responsibilities, obviously also very important. That's why we've been talking about them. We'll get into some laws this unit, but knowing your rights, knowing where, where they extend, where they stop, also very important. And of course, being able to understand basic security and privacy principles, understanding that malware is out there, it can do a lot more than what you might see on TV. Um, more importantly, being able to spot scams. I've had so many people coming to me over the last, there must be some kind of campaign going on against certain people on a certain list. Because I've been getting so many messages over the last couple of weeks of people getting scammed left and right. Um, I had one person uh, I know fell victim, not didn't fall victim, but nearly fell victim to a romance scammer. Um, I had another person get contacted 
um, offered them $200 more than they were asking for a couch, but made them sign up for some other service to pay them. And I was like, stop, that's a scam. They're going to, they're going to charge a refund on that one. You're going to lose the couch and the money. There's a lot of stuff going around like this right now. Being able to spot st stuff like that's part of digital fluency, but it's also just part of with security and privacy and, and knowing when something is too good to be true, it probably is, right? So again, we boil all this down for children. This is what we usually tell them. The S3, the safe, savvy, social, this is what they're teaching my daughter over at Washington Elementary. Protect yourself and others, educate yourself and others, and respect yourself and others. That's what we tell children. But again, it's always far more complicated than that. Because the things that we usually lack in our cybersecurity awareness training and the things that we usually fail to teach kids in school, the things that we usually will even overlook ourselves at times are the things that are really easy, big targets for social engineering, right? Because we want that acceptance, we want that security, we want that connection. So falling for romance scammers isn't something that just dumb people do. People will fall for that for all kinds of different reasons because they they're missing something or they feel like they're missing something and somebody comes along and gives them, uh, makes them an offer, an offer they can't refuse, an offer to feel whole, an offer to feel, well, accepted, right? So relationships and communication, we don't usually talk to people about that. We avoid that in security awareness training in the corporate world because, well, we have, we have other concerns. We, we don't want to talk to people about their relationships. We don't want to tell people uh, you know, govern their private lives or anything like that. It's usually a bridge too far, but it's important because that's a major attack vector, the romance scams. We don't usually talk to people about cyberbullying or drama or hate speech or avoiding that undesirable speech or what to do if somebody says something or does something that is meant to be inflammatory, if somebody's trolling or something like that. We usually don't provide people with the tools, and that's an incredibly common thing to encounter online. It's all over the place. And we don't talk to people about news and media literacy. And well, look where that's got us. I'm not going to say anything more on the subject. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's because we often look at certain places online as being family friendly, or at least as being safe. But there is no such thing. So for example, Facebook meta is still, for some reason, somehow, at least for the short term, uh, the most popular social media uh, platform on the planet, Bill billions, billions with a B, billions of users all go on Facebook. Oh, also, by the way, it's kind of interesting, uh, Meta as a case study for Bernaysian marketing, because you'd think logically it would follow that if a company has resources for marketing, they'd be able to afford the best marketers and the best marketing program and sell a product. And yet look how Meta is doing. I guess it just goes to show, right? <laughs> anyway, so they have billions of users on Facebook. It's the preferred global platform for all kinds of things. Um, there's, of course, crazy aunts and uncles on there. Grandma and grandpa are on there. Parents are probably on there. I know students are still on there for some reason. Though, honestly, if I want to know what students are up to, I check Yik Yak. Hilarious on there. If you haven't checked, it's really funny. Yik Yak, yeah, it's a social media platform that uh, got <laughs> it got banned and went down in flames years ago. But it came back. Uh, it's basically just like uh, see, social messaging platform for um, people within a general vicinity. So I live pretty close to campus. I can see everything people are saying in the dorms. It's fucking hilarious. Uh, yeah, I reckon. So uh, yeah, anyway, at any rate, <clears throat> Facebook was actually central to the issue in Lester Packingham Jr.'s case. Um, and so fundamental, the Supreme Court decided was one's ability to access Facebook, uh, that it was struck as a condition of his parole and he was allowed to participate or at least view the activity going on on Facebook. That's how fundamental the Supreme Court considered it back then, which was 2017. Um, but Facebook is also accessible to everybody. And so not only is it a place for grandma and grandpa to spend, spread their QAnon shit, it's also a place for um, gang activity, gang members, uh, cyber criminals, and so on, 
even known offenders, people who are incarcerated can still access Facebook. They got computers in prison. At least they get a little bit of computer time to do things like take classes or what have you, play MMOs, I can assure you. Um, and so rather than thinking of Facebook as a fairly safe place where Americans of a certain age go in order to be influenced by Russian misinformation uh, campaigns, uh, it could be likened more to a CD dive bar because while you would go to a place like that, you wouldn't necessarily feel safe, right? If you go to a biker bar or a rave or a violent demonstration or something like that, and something bad were to happen, you would say, well, of course, those are inherently dangerous places. But if it happens on Facebook, for some reason, it's shocking. But it shouldn't be, because of course, there's dangerous people on Facebook. There's dangerous people everywhere, right? Even drug dealers. So um, I don't have an answer for that. Because you know we collectively as a society don't have an answer for that. Um, you know we're mixing messages and we're mixing listeners and we're mixing audiences. There have been many attempts of course to do this. We talked about those last week. Google made an effort to curb YouTube content, for example. This is the uh, adpocalypse days. So an interesting, uh, interesting convolution of different things here. You had the economic incentive of Google censor YouTube because the uh, COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act, essentially means that businesses like Google cannot by law monetize data that they have mined from subscribers under the age of 13. And there was a lot of content out there that was obviously marketed to people under the age of 13. A number of very popular Social media influencers arguably market their content to subscribers under the age of 13, like Jake Paul, for example. And uh, rather than going directly after those influencers who are obviously misattributing their market audience with their uploads, instead, Google made the decision that in order to stave off any potential lawsuits or any potential complications with the federal government at a later date, that they would basically try to make all of YouTube more kid friendly. And it did not go very well. But they really had to do something because YouTube at the time, if you're not familiar with YouTube circa uh, the adpocalypse, uh, it was a, f let me show you. Oh, that's right, it's doing this. I gotta enable editing. I gotta go to the thing, I gotta edit the link, I gotta copy, I gotta paste. So there was a time when low tier auto generated content uh, targeted definitely at children was all over the place. And occasionally you would come across live action shit like just the most insane, look at this is 11 minutes long, or 12 minutes long almost. I mean, you can't say that it's not marketed towards children. It's definitely violating trademark and probably copyright laws. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's quality content, that's right. And uh, my, uh, my daughter grew up with YouTube around the time before Adpocalypse and this kind of stuff was all over the place. And most of it was just annoying, um, but uh, in certain cases like that, it was truly shocking, <laughs> truly shocking. So with that all over uh, their platform, uh, Google, and while their subsidiary YouTube, but if, let's be honest here, it was Google that was really putting the pressure on them to do this. Um, they didn't want to get rid of that content, but they had them, they were in a position where they had to uh, um, essentially not monetize that content because monetization process at Google essentially requires data mining users and selling that data, monetizing that data, and then a portion of that goes towards um, the uh, the actual creators of those, which is why there were so many procedurally generated videos at the time, because the more videos you had, the more you could monetize, the more money you made. And so that's why they call it the apocalypse. But they did so knowing that what they had essentially at the time was a very delicate ecosystem, right? The last thing that they wanted to do is tick off their content creators, because YouTube, of course, does not create, well, they tried YouTube originals for a while, that's gone. Uh, but they don't actually create any content of their own. They're definitely relying on people to create content. And so to incentivize that, they started the monetization program to begin with. 
And this effectively pulled the rug out from under a great number of different content creators, because not only did they segregate content that was for children, and if you make content for children, when you upload to YouTube, if you've never done it, you mark whether or not the video is for kids or not. If you do that, then it's a different revenue stream. It can't be monetizable along the same, and a lot of times it's not monetizable at all. But at the same time, they also wanted to make sure that they segregated other content in order to further separate it from children so that they would not accidentally come across that. They tried YouTube for kids, didn't really work. Um, but there's always, of course, uh, the problem of children who simply say that they're older than they are. And so it ended up um, causing a lot of content creators who had, let's say, uh, content in certain risque areas um, would cause them to be demonetized too. So if it mentioned blood, gore, um, not that long ago, uh, the channel Ask a Mortician, and this is like within the last couple of weeks, if I recall, uh, had a documentary about a boating disaster or a naval disaster um, in which they put in a lot of effort, interviewed people, including survivors and so on. Um, and the whole video got shadow banned. It didn't just get demonetized. It got removed essentially for a little while, um, still due to these rules that were put in place all the way back then. Now, so, uh, so problematic was this for certain YouTubers and of course, they made lots of videos complaining about it, but one of them decided to go a little bit farther uh, and actually directly threaten YouTube itself. And we're talking here about Nassim Agdam, whose picture you might remember from a couple of weeks ago. So Ogden specifically in several videos um, cited the apocalypse as being the reason for her ire. She had tried to contact people at YouTube about the what she what she perceived as the um, discrimination she faced. Uh, she was a vegan bodybuilder and singer and dancer uh, and uh, noticed or at least perceived uh, after Adpocalypse that her viewership had declined significantly. And that may, that may be the case. I mean, we are talking about the algorithm here, right? A small change in an ecosystem that sensitive can have some unknown effects. But if you never had the pleasure, here's a new sample of her work. Okay, I say I was a fan. <laughs> I'm going to assume it's because just watching somebody eat a carrot does that to you. So I can't imagine it's any other reason. So, as I said, she perceived it as being a change uh, that led to this. She saw discriminatory action. Um, but it doesn't seem like she had much of a following to begin with. So, you know, I guess we'll never really know. But, uh, so, I mean, it's not as if, um, obviously, what she did is wrong. 
there's no, no question about that. There's, there's no world in which I would endorse direct violence against people who are working at YouTube because you know they perceive to be um, some change that affected them in some way. That's just ridiculous. But um, there is some seed in there in that, I mean, these changes affected the livelihoods of thousands of people, thousands of people who had devoted their careers to providing content for other people, which enriched YouTube and Google in, in turn. Uh, and yet, when push came to shove, um, well, YouTube didn't exactly handle it exa the best that they possibly could have. They just made changes and chips fall where they may at the end of the day because they weren't interested in protecting the creators. They were more interested in protecting the corporate entity. And that's the problem, right? Because um, there isn't one algorithm. There's several algorithms. There's all, of, even to this day, YouTube still has um, different categorization processes and none of it is open source. It's all proprietary, even the largest YouTubers with the largest following with direct corporate contacts cannot get straight answers because even their contacts at YouTube do not know how it works on the back end. There's actually a really good Nerd City video about this if you want to watch it, where they did a deep dive on YouTube's content uh, categorization process uh, where they, they tested out some different things. And to the best of their reckoning, it seems as if uh, there are certain buckets that videos are automatically placed in based upon any number of factors, including some um, image recognition software that detects things like what looks like flesh or what looks like blood or certain words that come up that are automatically translated. The caption feature is part of an algorithmic process that also processes that text for categorization. So whenever I upload a video from this, oh yeah, by the way, uh, there is a YouTube playlist of all of the videos because Zoom only stores them for 60 days, apparently. Uh, and that's gonna suck if you're studying for the midterm and then later on for the final, because it's more than 60 days. So there's a YouTube playlist you can go to. Well, when I upload the, the lectures for this class, that all gets auto-translated and God, some of the shit I've said, I know that those videos <laughs> are going into some fucking bucket somewhere, right? <laughs> I can only think of what YouTube thinks of me. Um, and the algorithm is going to be different. Every single social media platform is going to be utilizing them in some fashion. And so the amount of citizenship that you can engage in, the amount of speech that you can enjoy, the content that you get comes down to essentially how those are working, which means, to paraphrase Animal Farm, um, you know, all pigs are equal, but some are more equal than others in the end. So the answer is yes. Uh, there is free speech. You do have the right to that as long as you follow their terms of service. But even when you do, at the end of the day, you're really kind of being controlled by math on the back end, which is why I always recommend using VPNs and having multiple accounts, because I can tell you that if you, if you feel like you're pigeonholed on TikTok or something like that, switch accounts, a whole new world, right? Um, and there's a term for this as a long ways back, it's kind of the banality of evil, because as Nassim Ogdan felt, but which is incontrovertible in some cases, um, these controls over speech, the sharing of content, the amplification of messages, does undoubtedly end up being discriminatory for some people at some point. There's just no way to avoid that. It's the same problem we're seeing right now with AI that's trained from content from the internet. I'm sure you're all familiar with some of those cases, right? There was an AI not that long ago came out, was trained by the internet, and within 48 hours, it was using the N-word on people, right? And the internet's a toxic place, okay? It just is. And it's not toxic because the people on it are, it's because the toxic messages get amplified because people are engaging with them, usually for the wrong reasons, but they are engaging with them. They're inflammatory, it gets people's attention. It's the banality of evil. It's not personal, it's just business. It's math, math doesn't lie. Statistics don't lie. Although Mark Twain did say there's lies, damn lies in statistics. Um, and if you control messages, if you control the news then you control what people think, which is why people like Jeff Bezos have bought print media. And then from that point on, they were quite favorable of pretty much anything Amazon or Jeff Bezos wants to do. We also get our information through information seeking systems which these days means search engines and social media algorithms. Determine what you see, when you see it, how you see it, and so on. 
which brings us to one of the, oh shit, it's three o'clock. Um, uh, let's, we started late, let's use up a little more of our time. I won't let it go. All right, so which brings us to one of our biggest problems with this, uh, which of course is, is often minimized in our day and age as Tyler, the creator here has, saying that if you're being cyber bullied, all you need to do is just walk away. It can't possibly be real, so on and so forth. And there, there was a time, um, not when Tyler said this, of course, it was many years before that, where that advice probably would have been viable. You know? that, that was back when the online space didn't consume so much of our lives, but that's not the case anymore. There are plenty of incidents of harassment and bullying that do have real world effects as all things do. And uh, this is in our day and age, one of our more divisive issues that we must deal with because again, so few people will even recognize it as a real problem. But victimization is <laughs> very real for some people. And this can be traced back directly to those dark tetrad traits we discussed before, because as E.E. E. Buckles et al. in Personality and Individual Differences postulates, dark tetrad traits such as sadism and psychopathy will lead to trolling because people with those traits will express them and find that expression pleasurable. Space transition theory tells us that even people who are otherwise well-adjusted in real life will, as we said before, go into COD and sit in lobbies and start hurling epithets to 12 year olds because it's pleasurable. They just suppress those urges when they do. Now, I also note, of course, these uh, victims here, of course, majority of them are female, uh, but don't worry, fellas, we're definitely represented in this area as well. Just like with every other area of suicide, it actually does disproportionately affect men rather than women. It's just the way the statistics go. No matter what age group you're in, we're always far more likely to off ourselves. You can trace that back again if we talk about uh, that unit with the dark tetrad traits we talked about, everyday or casual sadism, right? casual apathy. This is just the way society is structured, the way that genders are socialized and it has outcomes. Now, who is most likely to be cyber bullied? Who is most likely to be a victim? Well, that's going to be generally, uh, in terms of gender, it's usually about 50-50, but of course the way that we're bullied is different between men and women. Um, gender is not usually, again, a factor online unless somebody brings it up, in which case that's usually when the bullying begins, but it is. Uh, but typically what we see in a victim of cyberbullying is persons with a disability. And it doesn't have to be, we're not talking necessarily about a physical disability here, although that is the case. Uh, but generally, people who are simply neurodivergent, uh, people who are a little bit different offline, they tend to be a little bit different online too, and that makes them a target for bullying. That and persons with a disability, be it developmental, physical, or learning in some fashion, are also more likely to spend more time online, which if Facebook is a CD dive bar, well, the more time you spend in a place like that, which on the internet is everywhere, more likely you are eventually to run across somebody who is willing to victimize you. Now, offenders who does cyberbully under 16, overwhelmingly female, but after that, by age 23, it's definitely overwhelmingly male, <clears throat> which is why in my example, in the COD lobby, it's always a guy who does it. As I always say, it's a, a guy in his late 20s just got off the shift from Taco Bell, decides he's gonna harass some poor kid online. Well. In that scenario, that would more likely be. But for a younger offender, well, it's probably mean girls at school, right? In either case, whether they are female or male, whether they're 16, 15, 14, 23, 41, or what have you, we do see in research that dark tetrad traits of sadism and psychopathy are highly pronounced in those individuals not necessarily to agree where it becomes diagnostically relevant to the point where they could be diagnosed with an access B personality disorder, but they certainly have those traits. Now, the reason for the gender swap isn't because women with those traits grow up, grow out of it, move on with their lives. It's because, again, of socialization of gender in our society. Typically, by the time uh, girls reach age 17, they have been socialized to the point where suppression of those traits becomes paramount 
Whereas by the time uh, guys grow up a little bit and they get out of the house, they generally have more freedom to express those traits than their parents. Now, the reason that cyber victimology is such a big problem is because you can't simply walk away anymore. Too much is done online. And if Lester Packingham Jr. has a constitutional right to use Facebook, well then goddammit, so does everybody else. But um, with that truth, that change in our society, comes the realization that we can't just close the laptop and walk away, we can't just close our eyes, that we have to deal with this, and that the problem of online versus off is far worse, because technology improves efficiency of systems and it improves or increases instances of flaws in that system, and bullying is just a flaw in that system that is increased with our ability to communicate. So, for example, there have been many studies on this. Here's the, you could say, attack vectors for traditional bullying. Um, verbal, exclusion, physical, so on. Traditional bullying, face-to-face, -face, versus the attack vectors, you might say, for online victimization, where it's via phone, text, email, chat, message boards, instant messages, video. And this was a couple of years ago. We could probably add a couple more categories onto that these days as well. But there's simply more avenues for harassment. Um, and many states in the union, including wonderful Wisconsin, those have laws on the books in order to uh, prevent computer systems from being used as a vector of attack. I have seen people who were charged with this. I, I know of a kid over at, I won't tell you which school, one of the junior highs that uh, was recently charged with this for making threats on Discord. Please use unlawful use, I know. <laughs> I, I know, all of a sudden you're like, I gotta go erase my fucking history. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, unlawful use of a computerized communication system. It is a misdemeanor. It can be a felony if it exacerbates to the point where those threats could be realized. Um, it includes doxing in addition to using the, uh, the communication platform to frighten, intimidate, threaten, abuse, or harass, and so on. Um, and yeah, so it's a misdemeanor, but it can elevate to a felony if necessary. Um, we also have cyber stalking laws here in Wisconsin. Uh, it works off of what's known as a course of conduct, which is two or more acts carried out over, that's literally the text, carried out over time. It does not say specifically within two weeks, within 24 hours, within 48 hours, it just says carried out over time. And it's two or more instances of unwanted contact, which would include all kinds of things. Okay, uh, we are just plain out of time. I'm gonna have to uh, uh, make sure that the exam is written to account for this, we're on slide 24. But I can't hold you here longer. Uh, I need you to let, let you get to the other classes. So take care, good luck on the final, we'll see you next week. Uh, yeah, but if I start down this, I'm not going to get where I need to go anyway. I was hoping to get there, but it's just not going to happen. <laughs>